Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and, and hello to our friends who are online today. We're delighted that you could join us here on this very special UQ Giving Day to learn more firsthand about the incredible research that's being pursued from UQ and specifically from within the Institute for Molecular Bioscience. For those that you who aren't aware, my name is Kamira Lawrenson and I'm the Director of Advancement here at IMB. And it's my um, great joy to shepherd us through the information that we'll be hearing a little bit later today. Um, this is a hybrid event. So we have our wonderful guests who are joining us in the virtual space. And then we have our guests here in the room with us today. So for those that um, are bearing with us online, we will be saying hello to you throughout, but we promise we're not looking away to nothing. We've got a, a wonderful collective of friends to the Institute here in front of us. Um, so without too much further ado, first I would like to, I mean, first things first, our acknowledgement of country. So the University of Queensland acknowledges the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today and those that you join us from digitally. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their value. Um, I'll just gain some assistance with this because unfortunately our friends online won't hear if it's not into the microphone. Take two. We're back. Excellent. Um, so as I've mentioned already, today is a rather unique Meet the Researchers. We do, um, we have four of these events throughout the year and they give us a wonderful opportunity to open up the sometimes complex and overwhelming world of science to the wider community in a way that um, we, we the humble humans can digest it. But today is UQ's Giving Day. And last night we had the wonderful joy of putting our first Ignite Innovation Awards on. And our fund for this year is in fact the Ignite Innovation Fund. We have some wonderful people in the room with us today who are dedicated donors in that journey of empowering the future research that is blue sky science thinking, but with a vision to translate that to market to make an impact to as many people as possible. And so with that, you will um, hear a little bit more about UQ Giving Day. I hope for those that are here with us on site today, you've had the opportunity to go through the, the, court, the, the great court and um, seen some of the wonderful festivities that are happening right across UQ as part of a day that is about people, no matter who they are, where they're from and what they want to achieve, there's a, there's a small way that they can get involved with UQ and empower education and research into the future. I'd also like to um, acknowledge our following special guests. We do have um, Dr. Christian Rowan in the room with us today, who is the state member for Mogul. We also have the wonderful Mr. Alan Grummet, who is one of our wonderful director circle members. And I'm looking across the room and I can see also Selwyn, uh, Selwyn Russell, one of our longtime director circle members. And um, we also have a couple of them sitting up here on our panel as well. Our own director, Professor Ian Henderson, is a proud member. And we have a, a newly mentored director circle member in Professor Craig, who very kindly made a dedication overnight to the Ignite Innovation Fund. And so with that, I would love to actually hand over to the far more impressive minds that are in the room with us here today. And I think SJ is going to be disappointed in me because I forgot to click and take everybody on the journey with us. Um, so without much further ado, I'd like to welcome our first guest, Professor Ian Henderson. So as well as leading us as the IMB director, the Henderson Group is focused on bacterial infections and immunology here at the Institute. Ian's research group studies bacteria and their interaction with humans and animals. Their research is focused on the discovery of genes and, they are, and how they are important for the building cell membrane and bacteria. Using genetic, biochemical and structural techniques, they study the activity, regulation and function of these genes and their products. Using um, animal models, they assess if 
if the products of these genes are important for infectious disease. The group's purpose is to apply this understanding to the diagnostic prevention and treatment of infections that can lead to life-threatening disease in humans and animals. The Henderson Group seeks targets for developing new antibiotics, vaccines, and novel therapies. And I'm, I'm no doubt Ian is going to set up for you now in his presentation as to how this is really one of the bigger issues that we are faced as both the human race and also animals and how his team is having a dynamic crack at keeping the next pandemic at bay. So Ian, over to you. Thanks, Kamira. This is still on. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to do a little exercise and you guys who are at home can do the same thing. Just put your hand in the air, give a little wave. Okay. So if you're now under 50 years of age, you can take your hand down. Okay. That was life expectancy 100 years ago, 50. If you're under 60 years of age, you can take your hand down because your lives have been saved by vaccines. If you're under 75 years of age, you can take your hands down. Your lives have been saved by antibiotics and sanitation. And every other medical intervention that we have developed has saved your lives, the ones with your hands still up. So just reflect upon that. Of the 30 years of additional life expectancy we've gained over the last 100 years, sanitation, vaccination, and antibiotics have saved most lives. Okay, Increase that for 25 years. Oop, am I going the wrong way? There. And this is just the WHO numbers for causes of death today. All right. Most, and I do this exercise with the, with the students. When they come in and I first start teaching, I say, what causes the most deaths globally? And you know what? The last two classes I taught, every single student said cancer. And that's not true. It's actually a small portion of the global deaths. Still today, cardiovascular disease, heart attack and stroke are the number one killer. Number two is infectious diseases. Um, and of course, then there's trauma, injuries, respiratory uh, disease, maternal and perinatal disease, etc. But in fact, even when you look at all of these diseases, you see infection plays a significant role in these diseases. Approximately 40% of cardiovascular events are associated with infection. 30% uh, of gastric cancers are associated with infection. You look back to pylori, 99% of cervical cancers associated with viral infections. 11% um, of uh, deaths, maternal deaths are due to sepsis. And key to all of these diseases is the role of antibiotics, okay? So when you are getting cancer treatment, you need antibiotics, you know, to protect you from uh, infection because your immune system gets depleted during treatment for cancer. Uh, if you get severe trauma, car crash, and you go to hospital with severe trauma, they'll give you antibiotics to stop you from getting an infection. If you've got uh, to get a stent replaced, they give you antibiotics to stop you getting an infection when you, you've been stented. And of course, there's uh, the role of antibiotics in digestive diseases, disorders, et cetera. So antibiotics play a key role in actually allowing the use of modern medicine. But what's happening is the world is heading towards a post antibiotic era in which common infections and minor injuries which have been treatable for decades can once again kill. That's from the World Health Organization. So the prediction is within 30 years, antibiotic resistance will be responsible for 10 million deaths a year. Let me put that in perspective. We've had 4 million COVID deaths so far. It's 10 million deaths a year from antimicrobial resistant infections, just from that. That doesn't count all infections, just for antimicrobial resistant infections. And even in Australia, we can plot what has happened with infections across the Australian population. So this is just uh, deaths due to infection in Australia. You can, uh, anybody want to guess what the peak is back there in 1918, 19? 
That's it. It's the Spanish flu. That's the peak of deaths due to infection. And of course, and this mirrors the global picture over the decades, the number of deaths due to infection go down. And why? Introduction of vaccines, smallpox, diphtheria, tetanus, and whooping cough vaccines in the early part of the last century. Then come antibiotics, penicillin, tetracycline, vancomycin, uh, and more vaccines for polio, measles, mumps, rubella, hepatitis B, and Haemophilus influenzae. But mid-1980s, what happens is the number of deaths due to infection starts to increase. You have antibiotic resistance emerging, and you've got the problem of HIV. And if you look at the projection, uh, or just over the last uh, uh, 20 years, you've got infectious diseases have, have an increase of 300%, but actual fact, deaths due to cardiovascular disease have gone down by 50%. And if you model what's happening, and this is pre-COVID, this is the trajectory for deaths due to infection in Australia. OK, so out to uh, 2060, uh, where we would be back at the same number of deaths as we had back in 1910 due to infections. So how do we respond? You know, antibiotics, you know, are really key to pretty much everything we are doing, all the major interventions we have in modern medicine. So if you don't have them, you won't have, you know, treatments for your children's like, you know, um, uh, um, ear infections. You don't have the ability to have cesarean sections to deliver children. You don't have heart um, uh, uh, stent replacements or major open heart surgery for your, your wife or your husband, because antibiotics are key to keeping you safe through those medical interventions. So how do we respond? We make vaccines, we make, uh, you know, uh, to prevent infection, and we look at new ways to treat infections. So that's new antibiotics, because we were pretty much run out of the old ones. Uh, new ways of thinking of treating, using things like bacteriophage, those are viruses that infect the bacteria, and actually just mo modulating our immune system, can we actually modulate the immune system so that it responds in an appropriate way that helps kill bacteria? And one of the things that um, uh, uh, we've done is, or, well, the immune modulation that I'm talking about, and I'm gonna talk about is harnessing your body's natural defenses. And the thing I, our group has been focused on is a molecule in the immune system called an antibody. Now, antibodies are actually the bit of the immune system that are stimulated by vaccines and pre prevent you getting uh, 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 infections. And what they essentially do is they bind onto the surface of um, an invading microorganism, a virus or a bacterium, and they simply act as a little flag that says the bad guy is here and the rest of the immune system runs in and clears up and kills off this little bad guy. Okay, that's the role of antibody. But a few years ago, we were studying a disease called bronchiectasis. Now, Christian, you probably know what this is, but for those who don't, it's a disease that affects, uh, affects, afflicts uh, adults, predominantly adults in their later years, and um, children. And in children, the disease is called cystic fibrosis. And people with bronchiectasis get uh, an infection um, with a bacterium called Pseudomonas. And once they become colonized with Pseudomonas, it's extremely difficult to eradicate that bacterium because it's very antibiotic resistant. OK. And so what we found when we were looking at patients with, uh, with this Pseudomonas in, uh, infection in their lungs, that um, they had a weird antibody response. So their antibody Rather than, you can see this, uh, let's see, in this side here, okay, uh, their antibody in some patients didn't kill the bacterium, which it was it supposed to do, right? And that, that inability to kill the bacterium was associated with really poor lung function compared to people who had normal antibody that killed the bacterium, okay, that was in their lungs. And what we found is that these patients here with this poor lung function and who couldn't kill didn't lack the antibody for killing. They actually had way too much 
antibody circulating in their bloodstreams. Okay, and that circulating antibody was actually preventing killing. So it's a bit like what we call the Goldilocks effect, right? Antibody is like a Goldilocks event. You can have too little and you don't get enough protection, or you can have too much and you don't get any protection either because it allows the bacteria to grow. And so you need just the right amount of antibody. So having established that these patients had too much antibody, we ask the question, what can we do to treat them? Surely we can take it out. And the problem is, is I couldn't figure out a way just to specifically take out that bad antibody against the bacterium. And I remember still uh, to this day, sitting in my office, having the conversation with the doctor, the clinician who, who managed these patients. And he said, well, we won't take out, uh, out just that antibody. Let's take it all out. Let's take all of their antibodies out. And so we came up with the vampire therapy. Um, and so the vampire therapy is essentially a, a system that works. It's called apheresis or plasmapheresis, where we suck out the patient's blood. We remove all their antibodies and we put the blood back in. OK, and we did this on two patients here. Frida, a 69 year old female with multidrug resistant pseudomonas, no therapeutic option left. The, the, the bacteria were completely resistant to uh, antibiotics. Uh, she was on oxygen and nocturnal ventilation. And another patient, Fred, 64 year old male, again, the same thing, no antibiotics available to treat his pseudomonas infection, also on oxygen and nocturnal ventilation. And Fred in 2013 had only been out of hospital for three weeks, okay, or off of IV antibiotics in that whole year. OK, and what we did is we sucked out his blood and he actually, both of these guys left hospital within five days with no detectable pseudomonas in their lungs. We did the same when we came to Brisbane. Patient, lung transplant, got pseudomonas infection. We saw that they had this same problem and we were able to apply the va vampire therapy and uh, cure that, that patient as well. Okay, now the problem is, and I just to finish up, the problem with us in this therapy is we have a problem in that we can't develop this. Okay, there's no commercial interest in developing that, that uh, detection system. So to help those patients, we actually use research dollars to actually do the clinical detection, measure the antibodies and see if they're suitable for treatment. And so for us, the key thing for us is to actually get the funds to be able to develop a proper diagnostic assay. And so that's our challenge at the moment. And I'll just finish up on that and tell you why there are no new antibiotics available. Even though we can predict the apocalypse that is coming, First thing is, is this statement here by William H. Stewart, the U.S. Surgeon General from 1965 to 69. And he said, it's time to close the books on infectious diseases, declare the war against pestilence one and shift natural resources to such chronic problems as cancer and heart disease. And as a result, funding for infectious diseases in the U.S. and subsequently the, the world dried up. OK. So the amount of funding that goes into infection, infectious diseases now is minuscule compared to what we invest in cancer research. Here's another problem. Pharmaceutical companies exited the antimicrobial discovery space back in the 1980s. They could make more money out of selling a statin for it. And that's the value of the global market for statins, a trillion dollars a year. And here's the antibiotics uh, uh, value. It's $65 billion a year. So there's a lot more money in chronic disease treatments than there is in saving lives with antibiotics. And of course, there's a problem with regulations to actually just get new antibiotics onto market. But there's also a lack of public advocacy. Dead patients don't lobby. If you get an infection and it's drug resistance, you die and you're not there to lobby. If you've got some other chronic disease, you're around for years and you can go knock on Christian's door and say, Christian, we need a bit more money to solve this problem. Um, and of course, we're addicted to cheap antibiotics. You think about the cost for a drug for cancer, 
that will prolong your life for six months. And it could be $100,000 for a treatment, whereas we don't really want to pay more than five bucks for a course of drug and antibiotic that will save your life. But of course, the other thing is to reflect on is William H. Stewart, the US Surgeon General, never made that statement at the top. It is actually, you know, the, the uh, false reporting. OK, what he actually said, and he was misquoted in the newspapers, was warning flags are still flying in the communicable disease field while we are engaged in taking on new duties, cardiovascular disease and cancer. We cannot and must not lose sight of our traditional responsibilities. OK, and unfortunately, we did. But there you go. So that's my little story. We developed them. One of the stories in the lab is actually developing a new treatment for patients. It's effective, and we just need to get it out there. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Henderson. Um, um, you're off the hook until we do Q&A in a little bit. Yes, thank you. Thank you indeed. And thank you to our friends online who are keeping with us. We know how busy you are and how many plates you're spinning at any one time. So we're very grateful that you've made the time to join us here today, Ian. Now, without any further ado, it is my very great pleasure to hand the microphone duties on to our next speaker for today. She is, in fact, representing the, the VETA group and the extraordinary work that they undertake here at IMB. And so Dr. Jen Deuce is actually joining us to share a little bit more about her work directly with all sorts of things that should scare us. So she's working with spiders through to plants, anything that's venomous that might give them some intel on how it is that we actually feel and sense things in our veritable way so that they can actually develop new more effective, um, I'm going to get this word wrong, Jen, analgesics. Ana She'll tell you all about it when she gets up here. But it is my great pleasure now to hand the microphone duties over to Jen, who is an NHMRC early career research fellow here at the IMB and a fantastic, fantastic asset to the work that we're undertaking. Thanks very much. All right, um, so unlike some other diseases uh, like cancer, uh, infectious diseases, so sorry, Ian, and um, cardiovascular disease, pain doesn't really seem to get as much attention. Um, so it might surprise you to know that chronic pain, which is pain that lasts more than three months, actually affects over 3 million Australians. And the proportion of the affected population increases with age. So 68% of people living with chronic pain are of working age, and it is the cause of early retirement in 40% of cases. So not only does it cause a huge um, problem for quality of life for people who suffer from chronic pain, but it's also a huge economic burden on Australia as well. So how do we sense pain? Our nervous system can be broadly divided into two. Um, so we have our central nervous system, uh, which is our uh, brain and spinal cord. And then everything outside of that is defined as our peripheral nervous system. So when you get a painful stimuli, so you touch a hot stove or something like that, uh, your peripheral nerves will sense that pain and they will then transmit an electric signal along your peripheral nerves uh, to the spinal cord and then to the brain. And then that is perceived as pain. So what are our approaches to treat pain? Uh, we, we are researching on new ways to develop painkillers that target the peripheral nervous system. So we're working at blocking the pain signals at the source before they are then transmitted onto the central nervous system. And this is because most clinically used painkillers target, target the central nervous system. And the problem with targeting the central nervous system is that it has a lot of side effects. Uh, so you can have sedation, you can have motor impairment, and you can have addiction. So that's why we're trying to research ways that we can target the peripheral nervous system in the hope that we'll have efficacious analgesics without the side effects of current therapeutics. So specifically, we are looking to target ion channels, 
which are responsible for regulating the electrical activity of our nerves. And these are, are tiny little pores that are expressed along our nerves that open and close in response um, to changes in electrical signals um, to allow the passing of ions. So this is where venom comes in. Um, so venom is a secretion containing one or more toxins produced. Uh, traditionally, it was defined as by an animal, um, but we'll now introduce you to venomous plants um, that is injected to either deter a predator or capture prey. So we study venom from basically anything that has venom. Um, so we commonly look at spider venom, um, scorpion venom, cone snail venom, and more recently, plant venom um, from the Australian stinging trees known as the gimpy gimpy. And the reason we're so interested in venom is because toxins have independently evolved many times over in all of these different species, specifically to target our peripheral nervous system. Therefore, venom is a rich source of ion channel modulators. So how do toxins modulate ion channels? Basically, what they do is they directly bind to ion channels and they can have uh, one of two effects. So they can either enhance their activity, so cause them to be open more often than they normally are, or they can actually block them and stop them from working altogether. And both of these can disrupt the normal signaling of our nerves. So just to give you a small snapshot of our work. Um, so there's a rare genetic um, disease called congenital insensitivity to pain, which causes um, people with this condition to have no sense of pain, so they can't feel any pain at all, but all their other sensations experienced are normal, so they're normal. Otherwise, they can still sense touch, they can still sense temperature, but they can't sense pain. And the gene identified um, that was abnormal in these individuals was an ion channel called NAV1.7. So we thought um, if we could develop uh, something that selectively blocks this ion channel, we could have a, a novel um, at painkillers that could selectively switch off pain without affecting anything else. So it might be counterintuitive to think why would venom um, have a, a blocker of NAV1.7? Why would venom have painkillers? What you have to remember is that uh, venom didn't evolve for this. So what the, if you look at this spider as an example, this spider preys on insects. So its venom uh, was developed to uh, capture prey. So it may have a toxin that blocks an ion channel in insects, which causes their nervous system to stop working. They're paralyzed and enables it to capture its prey. Whereas humans, uh, we're much more complicated. We have a much more complicated nervous system and we don't just have one sodium channel, we have nine. And if we can find a toxin from this spider that only blocks one of our channels, um, this can actually lead to pain relief. So that's what we did. We went and we screened over 200 tarantula venoms to try and find a blocker of NAV1.7. And we did find one from the blue bloom bird eater tarantula, which is native to South America. And it's not Photoshopped, it is purple. And which is actually my favorite color. <laughs> um, and it did contain a selective blocker of the ion channel NAV1.7. And the toxin uh, was called PN3A. So PN3A is a potential drug lead that is highly selective for NAV1.7. Um, it's analgesic without causing the same numbing effects of local anesthetics. So it works on the same ion channel, except unlike local anesthetics, which block all of our sodium channels, um, PN3A only blocks NAV1.7. Uh, it's non-addictive. So unlike the opioids uh, like morphine, we don't have addiction problems. Um, no debilitating side effects, because you remember those people that have that condition where they don't have this channel working, they're otherwise normal, other than being able to sense pain. And there's no known decrease in effectiveness over time, which can happen with a lot of current painkillers, especially the opioids. And so a, a second part of our research, which I'll be talking about, is discovering new pain targets um, from venom that has evolved to cause pain. So some venom is primarily used for defense. So rapidly inducing severe pain is the best way to deter a predator. 
So the uh, venom that we were looked at for this was the Australian stinging plant known as Gimpy Gimpy. So you might, you probably know that Australia has some of the world's most venomous animals, but it may or may not come as a surprise that we also have some of the world's most venomous plants. And so two species that we looked at was the giant Australian stinging tree called Dendronite excelsa, which you can find in rainforests in Southeast Queensland, and also Dendronite moroides, which you'll find in North Queensland up in Cairns. So we became interested in these plants because of anecdotal reports, which you can look up online of how people describe the stings. Um, this one's pretty good. So this person said, being stung is the worst kind of pain you can imagine, like being burnt with hot acid and electrocuted at the same time. And because of this, and because of the pain that they can cause, some councils actually put up warning signs on bush, um, bush walking trails to warn people to stay away from these plants. So what happens when you're exposed to a gimpy gimpy sting? So those leaves are covered in um, fine needle-like hairs that when they come in contact with your skin, um, they inject you with a venom. And immediately you'll get pricking and stinging pain as well as itching and goosebumps. This is Irina's arm, by the way. Um, you'll get a rapidly developing wheel. Um, you'll get a a slow axon reflex there, which is the, the redness there and also sweating. Uh, and that's just in the skin temperature. So you can see there's an increase in blood supply as well. So the pain is intense, can be described as pricking, burning, crawling, shooting, aching that lasts for hours. Um, it can even last for days. And in some cases, we've had people tell us that it can actually reoccur for weeks, months, or even years later. So that's why we became interested in these plants. Um, so if we can find out what, uh, the what iron channel these um, plants are targeting, even though they won't directly lead us to a painkiller from the plant themselves, um, if we can find out what they do to cause such severe pain, we can then identify this target and then develop um, new drug leads that actually do the opposite and block this target um, to produce analgesia. And we are working on this, so hopefully maybe this time next year we'll be able to provide you with an update of what's actually happening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen. So many questions, so many questions after that presentation. So stay with us, friends online. We promise we're coming to some Q&A just on the back end of our next presentation. I'm glad you answered the first one, which was who was the brave soul who put an arm forward so that you could do the time measurements. Um, but I think that was an excellent example of how IMB has the largest collection of venoms anywhere on the globe. And so we have these incredible minds like Jen's, um, Irina's, uh, Glenn King, working from this very building to basically look for targets within venom that could lead to new drug discovery. And it also alludes to the fact that at 21 years of age, that's why we exist as an institute. We were the first institute at UQ established with the vision to translate really great science, but make it available and out to market to actually make an impact for the greater, greater world. And we are doing that in spades. And also, interestingly, the, we're all, we would all be quite familiar with the Nobel Prize. So the, the winner of the Nobel Prize this year was actually doing that in regards to pain sensory. And many of the people from within this building are working in collaboration with Andrew. So that is the level of um, capability that you are learning about today and that is being delivered from within UQ for the wider community benefit. And um, two ways I could segue to our next personality who's coming up to share their science is that when it comes to the gimpy gimpy tree, this next group is just as interested in this incredible plant and um, doing some great work there. But I think more importantly, if we're talking about the Nobel Prize, there is a, a particular level of recognition within science that is the step before the Nobel Prize. And so recently, Professor Craig was recognised as um, officially a new Royal Society member. Um, he hasn't quite had the opportunity to get to London and sign the book and have his name alongside um, his peers, such as Einstein and Newton as yet. But we're absolutely delighted to celebrate that his incredible breadth of science investigation 
um, in this field is being recognised. He's also one of our most adventurous souls here from the Institute. I think you're picking up that um, on the sign behind me, it says we dare to imagine. I think it should say our scientists dare to go go gallivating out to the wide world to find incredible samples and bring them back so that they can investigate them further. And so with that, I'm, I'm delighted to hand over to the microphone duties to David, who joins us on a round 4,000 kilometre trip from going around Queensland. So we're delighted to have him here with us today. It's a real special treat. Thank you um, very much, Kamara, uh, for the very overly kind introduction. Just let me work out how to do these slides here. Um, as Kamara said, I, I actually am, is this working? Oh, I'm just doing the slides here. Oh, well, okay. Um, yeah, look, I am officially on long service leave. I've driven 4,000 kilometres around Queensland. We've, um, we actually did discover a gimpy gimpy tree. Where's Jim? So didn't bring a sample back, didn't want to touch it, but, um, but um, um, I couldn't miss this event today. So we've, my wife and I have diverted to come back to, to, uh, to Brisbane today for this event. Um, but I should say, um, because of that, I'm not really prepared. And I want to just acknowledge the wonderful Dr. Annie Can for making these slides. Um, I'm going to be seeing them and running through them for the first time. So it'll be a surprise to me to see what we've, what we've got here. So uh, bear, bear with me as we wing through things. But the message I, I, we wanted to give here is that um, we want to pharmaceuticals in plants, using plants as biofactories. Now, before I start, um, I just wanted to, to give some background to my name. You probably guessed that uh, the man that's just re-entered the room, Ian, is from Ireland. Now, my heritage is actually from Scotland. I don't know whether that makes us competitive. Troubles with my name, and, and it's David Craig, but often I get uh, confused for someone else. And I did some consulting work for a German company a few years ago. And when the contract came, I should say they were paying me a lot of money, uh, too much, I thought, but I think they thought I, they had the wrong person because it was addressed to Professor Dr. Daniel Craig. And I don't know if you know who Daniel Craig is, but he's the, <laughs> the, the actor that plays uh, James Bond with a new Bond movie just coming, coming out. Um, uh, I think he gets about $137 million per movie, but I don't think I'm getting that today, Camara, am I? So, <laughs> Um, anyway, so um, yeah, so I'm not quite sure how they made the, <laughs> the the mistake, but I do like a dip in the UQ Lake every every morning, so perhaps it's understandable. Anyway, um, we work on peptides and proteins, so um, um, we we look at um, natural sources. Um, plants and animals and look at the peptides and proteins because we think peptides and proteins are the working molecules of life. These are wonderful molecules that control our physiology, control our defence. And when you think of a, a protein, you think of a piece of steak or if you're a vegetarian, a piece of tofu. Um, but when we think of proteins and peptides, we think of chains of amino acids. So a protein is just a chain of amino acids bodies and they're just linked together to form these proteins. And a peptide is just a mini protein of a few amino acids or even a fragment of a protein that might have broken down. So these are the working molecules of life. You're viewing this presentation today through a protein in your eye, crystalline in the lens of your eye. Um, if Chimera feeds you, then you'll be digesting that meal with, with a, an enzyme in your stomach. These are all working uh, proteins, working molecules of life. You're thinking about the presentation with neurotransmitters and hormones, many of which are peptide based. So, um, and the famous peptide is oxytocin, which is our sort of the so-called uh, caring and, and, and love hormone. So these are the working molecules of life. And we know probably the most famous peptide would be insulin. You've all heard of insulin. It's a wonderful substance in our body for controlling our glucose uptake, um, but also used by diabetics. Um, but we all know that the difficulty with insulin is that it needs to be injected. It can't. You, there's no such thing as, a, as an insulin tablet. And part of our work would be in the future to see if we could develop an insulin tablet so that diabetics wouldn't need to inject themselves and other people with other conditions where they needed protein-based drugs wouldn't need to inject themselves. And why is it that there's no such thing as an insulin tablet? It's because our body would regard an insulin tablet as just another protein and try to chew it up in the digestive tract before it got to the site of action. And, um, and he's done this animation here for me that shows a little enzyme chewing away at a little example of a little mini protein we've got here, chewing away at the ends, which is typically what these enzymes do. And you can imagine if you've had your ends chopped off, you're not gonna be very functional. And so insulin would be deactivated immediately. It got into our stomach. 
if we tried to take it as a, as a, as a tablet. So our work is about trying to overcome these weaknesses of peptides and proteins and make them more drug-like so that we can take our knowledge of, of natural peptides and proteins and turn them into useful drugs. And um, you know, there's other reasons why we don't like uh, injections. It's pretty funny if you're one of the guys at the end there watching someone else get injected. Um, but you can see the guy that's next in line is now beginning to think this is not such a, a funny idea. So um, you know, we all like to ingest our medicine rather than inject it if we possibly could. So how might we go about turning some of these wonderful peptides and proteins from something that you can't swallow as tablets into something you could? Well, it turns out evolution's done it for us. Plants discovered how to do this 200 million years ago when they invented cyclic peptides, peptides that don't have an N or a C terminus, but are joined in a ring of half a dozen amino acids that I've shown there. And so we study plants that have these wonderful peptides. We try to digest them with enzymes. The enzymes get very confused and very annoyed and can't digest these molecules. So we've discovered proteins and peptides that are super, super stable. Um, there's 66 of them in violet heteracea here. This is the native Australian violet. Um, and this was one of the first plants we looked at more than 20 years ago. In fact, from my, my backyard in Tra Chapel Hill um, is where we did the initial extraction from some of these. Uh, this particular species. And, and as I said, these sorts of plants produce these super stable cyclic peptides. We call them cyclotides. Um, and you might ask, why does a plant make a cyclotide? Why does a plant have a cyclic peptide? Well, we pretty much make lots of things for defense purposes. If you're an animal and you're attacked by a predator, typically what you would do is run away or fight or scratch or scream. Um, but if you're a plant, you can't do that. You have to have your own chemical defense. And so plants, I think, are super smart in that they've really got a chemical and peptide-based um, armory to try and protect themselves. And we showed this when we, when we first discovered these cyclotides by looking at the cotton budworm, which I've shown here, and um, taking one of our cyclotides, putting it in the diet of the cotton budworm, and watching a normal larvae grow to about 300 milligrams in size over 16 days. And then a molecule, a, a, a larvae that had been eating a cyclotide in its diet either doesn't grow or dies. So these are natural insecticides that plants produce to protect themselves. We've now shown that. We've worked with a local Australian company called Innovate Ag to develop the world's first eco-friendly pesticide that, that will protect cotton, macadamia and um, vegetable crops from this. This is now on the market and farmers are loving it. And it's going to the European market as, as we speak in, in terms of the regulatory process. So that's a homegrown example of how peptides and proteins could potentially uh, change agriculture by giving us uh, much more um, eco-friendly pesticides. I won't talk about that today. Um, I'll talk more about the pharmaceutical applications, but what I did want to sort of segue into the agricultural applications is to say that these peptides are sitting around in plants, protecting the plants, so they need to be super stable. You know, they're, they're sitting under the hot sun. These are super stable molecules, and that's what gave us the idea that we could use them as medicines or actually redeploy them as medicines. So I'll turn back the clock to 1970s when um, another anecdotal discovery was made by a Norwegian doctor that went down into the Congo region as part of a Red Cross relief effort um, after the tribal wars of the, of the late 60s. And what he discovered was that when, when women went into labour in the Congo region, the babies were often born very, very rapidly. And it was because the women were making a medicinal tea from a local plant called Old Land Eurofinus. We've just represented the tea here with a cyclic peptide in it. They were sipping the tea during labour. It was exhilarating the childbirth. And uh, the women were quite pleased because it, was, um, it, 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 it worked very effectively. And this doctor wrote his thesis about the, the topic. This is his PhD thesis from 1973. Uh, and that's really what got us the inspiration to start looking at plants that might have stable molecules in them. And so really, it's a sort of an anecdotal observation um, from the past. I just should point out this picture here shows the, uh, the African women symbolically giving some of this plant to a lady that looks like she's given birth to a fairly large baby. So she was probably pleased that it was over and done with pretty, pretty quickly. So uh, we learn a lot from nature by, by observing sort of indigenous practices. What we do is want to now take these natural defense molecules that are in plants and try to re-engineer them as, um, as drugs. And so we take the cyclic peptide I've shown there over on the far left, or, um, and we, we, we 
embed a new amino acid sequence into it that's going to have a therapeutic application, an anti-cancer, an anti-infectious disease function. And now we know we've got a peptide that will survive the digestive tract and deliver to its target. And I've just shown here a symbolic example of a cardiovascular drug we're developing. We call this grafting. And for the gardeners in the audience, it's just exactly what you do with plants. You take a rootstock and another plant, graft the two together, and you get your, your hybrid plant. This is my favourite. This is real. This is a pomato or tomato, a mixture of a cherry tomato uh, and a potato. And I like it because you can have your French fries and your tomato sauce on the same 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 plant. Of course, you can't propagate this, but you can, you can grow it and, um, and it's real. So we do molecular grafting. We do this initially by using our lab-based skills to synthetically make these peptides. We then test them in our pain models, as Jen talked about, or cancer models or models of cardiovascular disease, multiple sclerosis, just to give a couple of examples where this is all based on making these molecules using chemistry. But where we want to go now, and this is for the, the dare to imagine side of things, is for the future, you know, we've discovered some of these molecules in plants in the first place. We've re-engineered them. We know plants produce them by the bucket load. Why not produce therapeutic peptides in plants. So, you know, imagine if you could take your prostate cancer drug in a sunflower seed rather than having to take an injection or a, or a, or a tablet. Um, imagine we could mix multiple drugs together so that, that people wouldn't forget to take all of their 10 medicines, but that they could have a combination. And it could really change the, uh, uh, the face of both medicine and agriculture, because now farmers can be growing high value crops and getting, you know, $10,000 per per kilo rather than $1 per kilo like they do for wheat or, or cotton. So that's that's what we see as the, the blue sky future. Um, we got a generous donation from the Clive and Vera Ramachotti Foundation a few years ago that has allowed us to set up the facility. This is all now real, staffed, growing plants. I'd like to see the David brand sunflower seed. You can this, this is an actual brand of sunflower seed you can buy in America, but we'd like to, to have the, the pharmaceutical version of that on the market before too long. Um, and I just, um, to finish, give you a couple of examples that are real where we have expressed um, therapeutic molecules in plants, including this cone shell that you recognise from Jen's talk. This is Conus victoriae. We've worked on a peptide that's 150 times more potent as a painkiller than morphine. We've now got that growing in a plant. Um, we've got a, a drug that uh, one of my ex-students is now taking into clinical trials in Sweden for multiple sclerosis, and that's now expressed in a tobacco plant here. Um, we're working on uh, enzyme inhibitors for various cardiovascular conditions, including stopping bleeding during for, uh, surgery and, and also stopping blood clots. And some of you may have heard Simon Devere's talk at the Ignite Innovation Award last night. So Simon's part of the team there. Um, we're looking at prostate cancer, novel targets in prostate cancer. And uh, one of my personal favourites is you know, we've got an anti-obesity molecule and we can put that into potatoes. So if we get back to the, the image of Daniel Craig, uh, then uh, probably that the career would be enhanced if we could have that anti-obesity drug in a, in a French fry. Um, so um, if, in, if you like, we've come a full circle from discovering peptides and proteins in plants, working out what they do naturally and then re-engineering them to make them therapeutic. And now we're at the stage of putting those therapeutic molecules back into plants. So we like to think of this as coming the full circle and again, acknowledging Annie for her uh, brilliance in coming up with this concept in this, this slide. Um, and also just the final um, message I'd like to leave you with is that it's just a fantastic environment to work at here in IMB where we're encouraged to do this blue sky research, uh, not you know, restricted in our thinking. We can do non-traditional things. And you know, I like to think that what we do is we, we look at nature and we try to shine a light on what's happening in nature and then use that for human benefit. So I'll leave it there. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. And I think I speak on behalf of everybody online and here in the room that we're very glad that you took the time to come back and um, share that with us firsthand today. That was absolutely extraordinary. And with that, I'm now going to um, give you the joy of turning the tables and putting the spotlight on these incredible people. So I'll ask each of our researchers to come and take a seat here at the front. For those of us online, I think I should be getting a little bit smaller as we zoom out. So all of us will be on the screen. Um, and just while we wait for Jen and Ian to find their spot, um, 
as always, very humble Professor Craig. He has had some incredible support to his work over the years by way of philanthropy. And it's, it's certainly been the, the bridge to energizing some of this creative thinking. But um, I, I'm just so absolutely impressed with what you're doing. The thing we hear from many of our donors is your vision to democratize pharma is just absolutely inspiring. And the fact that there's the benefit of um, using nature to protect nature in a way by turning that into um, a solution for the world's, there wasn't too many problems up there on that screen before that we don't all face in one, one way or another. We ready, Tim? Am I allowed to let them go? Um, so I know that Marlon is on the chat for us. So please, for those of you online, make sure in the chat box below, if you can put your questions there. Those of you in the room, if you have a burning question, please put your hand up. But I do want to um, fire off the beginning of the Q&A with the inevitable question that has to be asked on a day like QQ Giving Day. If you could give us in a couple of words, how would, how would philanthropy help your research in the next 12 months? And I'll start with you, Ian, by virtue of you being close. Thanks, Kamara. I, I guess for us, um, the in the type of research we're doing is we are looking to develop um, a diagnostic assay that we can roll out to detect patients with those weird antibodies that prevent them from clearing infections. Um, and hopefully by getting it to a working model that we can actually then start to roll that out into clinic. But as I said, I think I, I explained at the beginning, there's not an awful lot of commercial interest in, in the sort of infectious diseases area like this, the antimicrobial resistance. So it, 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 it does rely on research dollars and, and philanthropy to get there. Um, so as I kind of alluded to, we've um, found a, a new pain target um, from the, the Gimpy Gimpy plant um, from our research there. And so the next 12 months, we are going to um, pursue that target and understand it more. Um, it's something that's never been um, described um, to be involved in pain before. So we don't know where it's going to lead us, um, but we're quite excited about that. Thanks, thanks, Jen. Uh, I guess from my point of view, we're we're biased. We love peptides and proteins because they're these wonderful potent molecules. But in the past, pharmaceutical companies have been a bit reluctant to to fund um, peptide-based research because of the problems of the oral bioavailability and um, stability. But we think we've solved those problems. But we're still finding the pharmaceutical companies need a bit of changing of their thinking. They're very conservative bodies, and so philanthropy has been fantastic in sort of having that vision to take on this new class of molecules that really is a completely untapped resource. So um, in the past, the philanthropy has been really helpful for us for opening up this whole new era of peptides and proteins. Thank you, David. I'm just going to pass the microphone to Marlon, as I know she's got a couple in the chat. Thank you, Kamira. The first question is from an anonymous attendee. The question is, you mentioned you are looking into treatment of multiple sclerosis. Did you people touch base the treatment for systemic sclerosis as well? If yes, where can I find any related details? Um, I understand that's for David. Uh, no, we haven't. Um, so far, we're, we've, we're restricted in looking at an animal model of multiple sclerosis called the EAE model of multiple sclerosis, where we can induce the disease in mice and then test our molecules on there. But potentially, the class of molecules we're working on would be extendable to other other related diseases. So that would be something for the future. But right now, it's just purely a, a mouse model of multiple sclerosis that we've worked on. That's hugely exciting. I think for those that are, us are faced with a, a world in which somebody is suffering with MS in our direct circle, we know just how devastating that disease is. Now, I'm not seeing any hands go up in the room before I ask Marlon for the next question. All right. Well, uh, here we go. Um, with boosted immune systems, how would that work, a drug for boosted immune systems, if, well, if someone's immune system is just so boosted that it's trying to fight its own body, like how would a drug take effect is sort of. Wonderful question. I believe that's for Ian. So that's a great, uh, a great question, but 
pretty complex. You know, um, when we say boost the immune system, it's probably modulating the immune system so it has an appropriate response. Many of the diseases that we suffer from are actually driven by inappropriate immune responses. So, and that's true of COVID today. It's, it's not really the virus that kills you off. It's the body's response to the viral infection, you know, the inflammation that comes from that. Um, and the same will be true for many of the other chronic diseases, cardiovascular disease, whatever. So it's about modulating how the immune uh, system works. So the Goldilocks effect, too little is not, not good, too much is not good. And it's just about modulating so it has the right response at the right time. I know that we have one in the chat waiting to go, but someone's handed me a microphone, so I have the power. So I'm going to fire off another question for each of you. And just in a, I guess, a couple of sentences, I'd love to know from each of you, what inspired you into the route of science? And the, the clean answer, if it, if it is an untoward answer. <laughs> um, so I'm a pharmacist. Um, I don't work as a pharmacist at the moment, I work in research full-time now, but I used to work in community pharmacy and um, in the pain field, we have limited options um, with drugs available. So I wanted to, to go out and find new um, treatment approaches for pain and develop better drugs because what we have now um, has limited effectiveness, has a lot of side effects and can cause um, a lot of problems with addiction and tolerance so that it's not working over time. Because from a young age, I always like to understand how things work. So I would dismantle anything and everything that came into our house, including radios, TVs, uh, old cars. So I used to just like taking things to pieces. Never very good at putting them back together again. But uh, that's as scientists, we like to deconvolute and understand how all the pieces work. But as you go on in life, you sort of move from taking cars and radios apart to, to using molecules to, to make new things. So I think it's sort of just an inbuilt curiosity on how things work and how we can re-engineer them to do other things. like taking things apart, uh, not an engineer, didn't put them back together, you know, but uh, what actually inspired me was, um, and, and David alluded to it, that I'm Irish, you know, and if you grow up in Ireland, the two things you will learn about, one in history is the potato famine, and two in biology is the potato famine, so uh, the microorganism that actually uh, caused the, 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 the potato famine, uh, Phytophthora infestans, and the consequences of that on humanity. And so um, I love this statistic, you know, in 1840, the population of Ireland was the same as the population of England. In 1950, it was about 9 million people. In 1950, the population of Ireland was just over two and a half million and the population of England was 30. You know, and so a, a simple event that an infection that occurred in, in a potato plant over a period of three, three years profoundly changed the, the nature of the country that I grew up in and actually profoundly shaped the whole world because the Irish colonized Australia, you know, huge you know, influx into to the U.S., etc. So it wasn't just the death from the famine, but actually just how... Uh, how the profound impact it had on humanity and the global population that extended for hundreds of years. Yeah. Thank you, Ian. I believe we've got some questions online, but I will just take my walk across the room here to make the point. I don't know of any great James Bond that came from Ireland. Do you, David? No, of a couple that came from Scotland, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for that, Ian. Um, the next question is from Maria Omega. It's a long one. So how many percentages have they developed to respond by providing the vaccines, new antibiotics?
Wow, that was an incredibly long and involved question, that one, I believe, Marlon. Um, and I think it actually carries across all of your areas of research. It didn't actually tap into one particular area. Um, we're inordinately proud of the work that has been done with the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and in fact, at the point that that probably didn't progress with the exuberance that everybody was anticipating, I learned firsthand about the prevalence of HIV in being used across vaccine development. And maybe one of somebody here might expand on that for the confidence. Nope, we'll have to call on Ian Fraser and um, Paul Young at a time that's more sitting. I'm, I'm conscious though, we've got um, a collective of really intelligent people in the room right here with us. And I am looking at you. Yes, fantastic. Hi, Craig Estwick's my name. Um, I don't know whether I'm one of the really intelligent people in the room though, but uh, what, I, what I've heard reminds me of, I did some postgraduate study here 20 years ago and uh, I always remember the definition of discovery is looking at what everybody else is seeing and thinking what nobody else has thought. And, uh, and that's what I hear across the work that's going on here. But my, my question is really, I'd like to hone in a little bit on, on the translation of these technologies and um, the focus on turning them into products in the marketplace. And maybe that's what that, I got lost on that question a little bit too, but maybe it was dealing with the translation question. Now, I know I know it takes a long time to get a drug to market. Um, 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 what do you call it? Drugs that, are, that you can undertake test with as opposed to drugs that you're going to um, um, put into people are a lot quicker. But... Uh, can you just talk about your areas as to how quickly you think you'll get something to market? That, that's the $69,000 question, that one right there. Um, Jen, did you want to attack that one first, given that uh, so much of your work is about target-based? And as a pharmacist, do you understand the other end of the spectrum? Um, yeah, so usually you don't get um, a new drug to market um, in less than probably 15 years. Um, there's a lot of phases it has to go through um, before it even goes into humans um, and then before it um, is more widespreadly used. Um, for us, we work, uh, the, the venoms usually have peptides. So that's what we work with. And peptides themselves have difficulties um, as being drugs as they are. Um, as David has said, they aren't usually um, active orally. Um, they get broken down, so you can't take them as tablets. The peptide I was talking about, PN3A from that spider that blocks NAB 1.7, um, it would have to be given as an injection. And at the moment, as it is, it wouldn't last very long. I mean, we would have a very short duration of action. Um, so only um, probably 20 or 30 minutes. So as it is, it's not suitable as a drug. So we're waiting for advances in peptide technology, which hopefully that's what you're working on, um, to, <laughs> to make ours um, more likely to be available as a drug. Did you want to expand on that? I could just give you the, the general statistics. As, as Jen said, it's somewhere between 12. The average drug takes between 12 and 15 years from discovery to, to approval and then marketing. Um, and the, and the, the, the average number is $2 billion US dollars. Now, that doesn't mean that a single drug costs $2 billion to get to market. That takes into account all the failures. So for every drug that reaches the market, $2 billion has been spent on a whole lot of other stuff. So it's not a cheap business. And so you can understand why pharmaceutical companies want to invest in, in drugs that are going to have a return because no one's going to you know, invest many, many millions of dollars and not expect a return. So it's a long-term process. And the reason that we like peptides specifically is because they haven't been explored as well as they should have been in the past. They're much potentially much safer than small molecule drugs because our bodies are now getting exposed to peptides and proteins, which we're used to dealing with all the time. And so when they break down, they're just breaking down into amino acids, you know, food, basically. So we think the intrinsic safety and tolerance of, of peptides and proteins is much higher. And you see that in the approvals with the FDA. So typically a peptide or a protein-based drug, talking about antibodies and others, yeah, uh, uh, they're about twice as likely to get through the final stage of, of clinical approval than what traditional medicines are. So we think we're off to a, 
a, you know, a, a competitive advantage by working on these natural peptides and protein-based molecules, which is why we've, you know, a good reason why we've chosen them. But there are other things that you can do, which is reprofile some drugs that are already licensed and use them for a different clinical indication. So for us, we're taking a treatment option that already exists in hospitals and just deploying that. Um, and so time to market for us, is relatively short. Um, but uh, there you go. And I think you meant diagnostic. Which yeah, diagnostic. Yeah. Yeah. And I think even within the VETA group, of which you're a key part of, Jen, I can reflect on um, looking at uh, TGA approved therapies and how they can be retrofitted for new purposes that they've not been explored before. And there's been success, success for you as a team, specifically around is it an arthritis drug? Yeah. And so now you're making a really big hopefully difference in that space as well. So um, there's many ways to come at the same piece of issue. And the next question is from Nina Mullins to each of the speakers. If you received a million dollars in donation today, what would it enable you to do? Who wants to go first? <laughs> All right, David. <laughs> That's, you know, for, for, for me, I think it's quite easy. You know, we have a, a diagnostic we want to deliver into market, but actually, in fact, uh, I think that would be more than enough for us to, do, to achieve that aim. Uh, we have a very specific type of technology we use in our lab that we're the world's leader in. Uh, it's a genetic test, and we would use a million dollars actually to identify every single possible target for antibiotic development. So as a global resource, so that there will be a resource for everybody in the drug development space, developing antibiotics. So that's what we would do. And I did want to mention, just reflecting on the previous question, while it does cost $2 billion to bring a drug to market, that doesn't actually count the billions of dollars of public taxpayer funding that went into the initial discovery research that enables that drug to actually get to market. So uh, that's important to remember too. Um, it's a hard question because normally we think the opposite. We have limited funds and we try and think what we can <laughs> do to make the most out of it. Um, but um, we would probably buy some really fancy equipment that would increase our screening ability. So we'd be able to screen a lot more venoms a lot faster across a lot more targets um, to increase our output to find um, new peptides because we've, um, we really um, have only characterize a very, very small percentage. Um, venoms contain hundreds of toxins in each one, and there's hundreds of different species of venoms to look at. Um, so yeah, that's what I would spend it on, some really fancy, really expensive new machines. Thanks, Jen. Um, we, we, we've got lots of um, lead molecules that we think potentially could make it into, into the clinic, but you just never know which one is actually going to make it. You never know which one might fail at some stage. Um, but we've been very lucky in terms of funding for equipment and infrastructure. So we have a, you saw it on the slide, a plant growth room where we can grow some of these tobacco and petunia plants where we're producing these peptides. My issue is the people to run it. And it's a... Uh, you know, it seems like a glamorous life being in the lab, lab and doing all this exciting research. But the fact is that the postdocs that are doing all this work are living year to year, basically waiting for the next NHMRC or ARC grant. And they find out in late October whether they've got a job next year. And to some extent, they're always thinking, well, what if I don't have a job? Where am I going to go to? If we had some greater continuity of funding, we could really give those people the security to look for you know, take on more challenging problems either and, and really have the ability to see something through rather than just sort of being a transient worker that does part of it. So I think we'd be very heavily investing in people. Thank you very much, David. I think that is just such a crucial point. Um, I get blown away every day when I talk to these remarkable people in this building about the challenges that they're up against and the fact that some of them are on 
one year contracts, living year to year, not knowing what pathway is in front of them. And it is a really challenging landscape for funding at present. And it can sometimes be that bridging of one more year or one, one more extension to be able to pull together the data and the proof points that could result in a fellowship or a critical grant in the very near future. So um, what you guys do with minimal um, minimal opportunities in funding is just absolutely overwhelming. Now I do bring this to a close. Is there any questions in the room before we move on? Going once, going twice. Well, with that, thank you very much to our incredible researchers who um, have dedicated a tremendous amount of time for us today in very, very busy schedules to come and share with you all firsthand and online as to what, what they're actually trying to achieve collectively and what they genuinely dare to imagine could be possible with great science, great tech and great mind that is in this building every single day. Thank you to each of you. Um, I, I cannot um, say goodbye to our friends online without communicating to you that we do have a save the date for you. We are having our final Meet the Researchers later this year on the 16th of November. Um, so it will be Meet the Researchers Daring to Combat Chronic Disease. And um, so on the 16th of November, 2021, 2 p.m., same same bat channel, same same bat place, same bat. I'm showing my age here, um, but please, if you're in a position to join us, come come and book on to be a part of that in the in November. Am I allowed to keep rolling? Always be nice to the technology guys. They are your friends. Oh. So. Before I bring it to a close for our friends online, I do need to touch once more on the fact that today is fantastically UQ's annual giving day. And so this is a day where no matter who you are within the broader community of UQ, if you're an alum, a staff member, a student, a, a broader loved one, it's a chance to get involved and show your personal commitment to um, education and its power to bridge the gap both in opportunity and access, but also in driving the incredible discovery across the UQ landscape because it is indeed a, a research intensive university, just like the remarkable stories that you've heard today. But it is also a chance to support the Ignite Innovation Fund at the Institute for Molecular Bioscience, since I'm getting the side eye from our wonderful director right here, which is... Um, to, to speak more, more genuinely about the Ignite Innovation Fund, last night we were delighted to be able to give out our, ignore, our ignore, inaugural Ignite Innovation Award to the very talented and very aspirational Melanie Oi, who's in the room with us here today. And that, in fact, is an award that was made possible thanks to, thanks to philanthropy. And so we... We are asking for further support to that fund because we want to continue to energise the people in this building to drive discovery just like the ones that have been championed here to you today and understand that with entrepreneurial and innovation pursuits, they can actually translate, put that to market and make a really big difference to the world at large. So if you are in a position to support the Ignite Innovation Fund and have not done so already, I do invite you to do so today. We will have these wonderful people in the purple t-shirts. There will be um, some iPads and whatnot, and you can actually make that donation before you leave today. Or if you're online, there's the QR code right there for you on the screen and you can convert um, from the comfort of your computer. And last but not least, um, we do really enjoy the opportunity to gain critical feedback about this community engagement opportunity. We want to ensure that we're giving you information and talking to you about the things that absolutely matter to you. So please take the time to give your feedback, um, feedback to each of our researchers today to let them know what you did or did not understand. Mine's probably on the, the, the quotient of about 30% versus 70%. Um, but yes, no, we, it's really important to us that you take the time, if you can, to share your thoughts. And so with that, I'll say goodbye to our friends online and wish you a, a healthy, happy day. And thank you again for um, joining us. And we really do appreciate the time.